Okay. Where to start is? Muchas gracias para invitarme aquí. Y I would like to welcome you to my presentation. And thank you for inviting me to CMM today. So as you can see from the title, From Preface to Practice, a narrative study of women learning to teach mathematics. So what this study examined was experiences as students all the way from when uh, my participants were young girls all the way through um, learning to teach mathematics in their teacher preparation program. And am I talking slow enough and clear enough? Okay. okay. So, first of all, uh, my agenda for this afternoon is to briefly share with you uh, my background, uh, my research interests, present to you this piece of research, and then cont my continuing lines of research, and then provide some time for questions and answers. So a little bit about me. Um, por 10 años, 10 years, I taught first through seventh grade, including math, middle, school middle school mathematics and science. So I taught in Australia, here in Chile, Chile uh, at Nido de Aguilas, and then in Texas and California in the States. So currently, I am an assistant professor of practice and research, but I have been recruited by Santa Clara University outside of San Francisco and I will start a tenure track position there in September. Okay. That's a little bit about me. So what are my research interests? Uh, primarily mathematics anxiety experiences in women elementary pre-service teachers. So es como su profesor es aquí, um, quien uh, básico, es cierto? Okay. And the development of pre-service teachers and beginning teachers' ability to attend to or understand children's language. Um, porque en Estados Unidos, um, muchos uh, alumnos hablan español, pero nuestro um, escuelas um, en inglés. So helping them understand Spanish through to English in mathematics in mathematics, and then their mathematical thinking. How do they make sense of solving mathematical problems? And as well as looking at their home and community knowledge. So what do children know informally about mathematics that they bring into the classroom? And I don't know if any of you are familiar with Barodi's work, Arthur Barodi, and he did a lot of work around um, children's informal mathematical knowledge and the importance of taking a very small child and using the math that they already know, even though they don't know they know it, and then utilizing that in the classroom. For example, when there's two children, two niños, and there's five pieces of candy, they're already dividing from the time they understand what candy is and they want to eat the candy. So it's taking those kinds of experiences and utilizing them in the classroom so that the, the math that they know intuitively and have already practiced, they can see the link to the mathematics that they're learning in school. And then ad additionally, looking at issues of equity and social justice that occur in the classroom. And from an equity perspective, what I mean there is looking at how girls learn math versus boys learn math. And then social justice, I'm not sure if that's an issue here in Chile, but in the United States, okay, yep, all right. So, social justice as well. Okay, so the study that I present to you today investigates the mathematics anxiety in women elementary pre-service teachers. And how I got interested in this was early on in my teaching career, what I noticed about the boys in my class versus the girls in my class is that the, girl, the boys tended to be very excited about mathematics, um, almost treating it like it was a race. You know, I can get the answer faster than you. Whereas the girls did not seem to feel very confident about their mathematics um, abilities. In other words, they wanted to know, they couldn't understand why um, a particular problem um, had a particular answer or which they were trying to understand through an algorithm. Okay? So one thing that really troubled me is during parent-teacher conferences, a mother of a girl in my class might often state that she herself was not very good in mathematics, therefore, 
she's made it through life just fine, and it's okay that her daughter's not good in math. She can be good in reading and writing and social studies. And so um, the mother would add, you know, she's been able to get through life just fine without the strong mathematical background. So from my perspective, however, these kinds of statements making math seem not attainable or possible or necessary give girls permission to exit themselves from being successful in mathematics because we have a role as teachers but parents also have lots of influence over their children. Okay. Of course. So then when I taught accelerated um, middle school mathematics, actually it was here at Nido de Aguilas, we would track or divide kids up and the kids who, were, who seemed to have a good grasp on mathematical concepts, we'd move them faster and put them in a class by themselves. So when I came over from the States, I actually taught that class. And what I couldn't, what was very hard for me to understand is seeing the girls, these were smart girls, coming into my classroom kind of like not believing that they somehow or another got to be recommended for the smart kid class. And in my mind, I just vividly see the boys kind of racing through the front door, like, yes, I belong here because, you know, boys are good in math, and I happen to be one of those boys. So I spent um, the year trying to convince the girls and showing them through their mathematical thinking that they were capable mathematic students and that they had much to offer by sharing their mathematical reasoning and thinking. So in other words, I hope that my teaching would send a message that being capable in mathematics did not inherently belong to the boys in the class. It wasn't a boys only. And then after 10 years of teaching children, I began a PhD program in education. And I was given the opportunity to teach pre-service teachers. And what I observed in the area of mathematics is that many young women seem to suffer from mathematics anxiety and confidence issues. So it was like deja vu, here I am again, only with the grown-up versions of the girls that I had taught in my elementary and middle school mathematics classes. And one pre-service teacher shared with me, um, for her, and this was often echoed by other teachers, pre-service teachers as well, is that math was and would always be one of those subjects that would just make her tense up and she was always going to find very, very hard and not enjoy. So I had the privilege of working with another professor at the University of Arizona and I began a series of pilot studies that examined the mathematics experiences of pre-service teachers. And what I found was that many young women who were in the process of learning to teach had these negative mathematics experiences students that years later were still accompanied by strong feelings of either failure, embarrassment, or humiliation, which they could vividly remember. And what I found really interesting about this is when we had them, we called it a well-remembered event tell us about an experience you had in mathematics. We didn't say tell us about a negative experience, bad experience, or a positive experience, good experience. Tell us about an experience. And over 70% of pre-service teachers, and the majority that I worked with were women, which I'll get into that in a minute, um, would go and explain about this negative experience. So. They also spoke of their mathematics experiences as being surrounded with anxiety. They spoke of having anxiety. I am anxious when I do math because of this. And over time, it appeared that their confidence had been slowly and progressively just chip, chip, chipped away. So I became preoccupied with gaining a better understanding of what happens to women who have experienced mathematics anxiety when they step into their own classrooms and then are expected to teach mathematics. So the study that I share with you today, I engaged in to learn more about the student and pre-service mathematical experiences of women who feel anxious and unsure about mathematics as they prepare to become elementary or in Chile, Asico teachers. And I'll preface it with saying, did every single teacher that I've had the, the privilege of teaching have mathematics anxiety? No, of course not. But well over, I would say, 50%, 60%, 70% had more negative thoughts about teaching math and very explicit um, experiences of mathematics anxiety um, overall. So there was, it was a pretty large number. So introducing to my study, we turn to the literature. So what does the literature have to say? Well, mathematics anxiety in women elementary pre-service teachers is a subject that is of great interest to mathematics educators. 
And women who pursue elementary teaching careers are often women who themselves have confronted mathematics anxiety during their own mathematics experiences as children. So in the States, we call that kindergarten through 12. Okay. And this draws on the work from Ball and Balak. So I'll just put, I just have the references here for all of my um, sightings as I look into the literature. Over 90% of all US teachers, elementary school teachers, are women, and this number continues to increase. And from my conversations with Salome, I think it's about the same here in Chile. Is that true? Okay. So mathematics anxiety can have significant implications for teaching mathematics. And I think we would all agree that having strong and confident elementary mathematics teachers cannot be underestimated. So I'm now going to present um, some pertinent literature on mathematics anxiety, as well as highlight some of the research that's been conducted on narratives, because that's actually the methodology that I used in my study, and their importance in teacher education. Okay. So um, before I get to that, looking at my research questions that guided my study. What narratives, okay, stories, shape women elementary pre-service teachers' mathematics anxiety as they prepare to make the transition or the change from student of teaching to a practicing teacher? And my second question which guided my study, what pivotal and salient experiences, so pivotal um, meaning uh, clear-cut and salient, very clear experiences do women elementary pre-service teachers say either propel them forward or move them backwards relative to their anxiety in learning mathematics and learning to teach mathematics. So my framework, looking at mathematics anxiety. First of all, it's more than not just liking math. Okay. It's, it's been defined in the literature as a state of dif discomfort that occurs in response to situations involving mathematical tasks that are perceived as threatening to self-esteem. So this could be a test. This could be some kind of a group work where uh, everyone in the group is expected to perform. Uh, in the States, we play a game called Around the World. And I don't know if they do that in Chile where you, <laughs> are you familiar with that? Okay, and that, I have more narratives written about the, the embarrassment and humiliation that students have felt because of never being the one to get out of their seat when playing um, around the world. Okay. Um, from a, a psychological perspective, there are unhealthy mood responses, panicking, losing one's head, feeling depressed, helplessness, nervousness, and also fear as well as the physical symptoms. And I think we've all been anxious about something so we could identify with what it feels like to have sweaty palms or tight fists, feeling sick, dry lips. And this, in the mathematics anxiety arena, can result in students losing their interest as well as their confidence in their mathematics, uh, mathematical ability. And then this lack of confidence can then lead to more feelings of mathematics anxiety. And then this, in turn, can result in um, people wanting to dodge or not do math, which reinforces more mathematics anxiety. And then I looked using narrative inquiry, because we know quantitatively mathematics anxiety has been measured, so we know it exists. But what about the narrative side? So drawing from the work of Kathy Carter and Well-Remembered Events, which I was referring to early on, tell me about an experience that you had. Looking at experiential narratives from Clanadin's work, as well as teacher's life history narratives. So in the study, I was interested in investigating what women had to say about their own mathematics experiences as students and as pre-service teachers. So now moving on to my methodology. So why use narratives as my method of gathering my data? Because narratives provide a clear focus on how new teachers make sense of teaching, including how teaching relates to their own experiences, as well as it's a research tool um, that goes beyond explanations of standards, percentages, skills, and strategies, or trying to capture what one has to say through the use of, the num through the use of a number. Both, in my opinion, are very important. You have to be able to measure it quantitatively, but you have also have to have an understanding of where it comes from. So my three participants, these are all pseudonyms, um, Estelle, Phoebe, and Roxanne. So these were 
three typical candidates that one would expect to see in the United States in an elementary teacher preparation program. And they were Caucasian women in their early 20s who were monolingual. They spoke uh, only English, although Phoebe there on the right spoke a little bit of Spanish. And what was really unique about these, four, these three women is they were part of a small cohort where we were gathering research for a larger study. So there were only 14 pre-service teachers in this particular class, which is unheard of. Normally, we have 30. So they, they got a lot of time and attention, and there was a lot of time to really build up trust to talk about uh, teaching mathematics. So how did I choose these three out of the 14? Well, out of the 14, I could have chosen 10. Um, but what I did is I, first of all, had to have their permission because this required um, a great deal of effort on their part uh, as I studied them over 18 months. And also, they, the mathematics anxiety that they spoke about was so clear in almost every sentence that they wrote. They talked about their experiences in a why they didn't think they were good at math, and then how they were going to handle teaching mathematics. And this autobiography in, in, um, at the University of Arizona, and where I'm going in Santa Clara University, we, one of the first assignments we have is wanting to get an idea of what the background of our pre-service teachers' um, experience in mathematics are. So we, have, so we ask some, some questions. So my data collection table here. Um, I collected data over 18 months, so the first data collection point was during what we call math methods, and while they're taking math methods, which is learning how to teach mathematics, uh, they also are in the classroom doing an internship. So they're not really teaching math or the other subjects, but they're observing. They might take out a small group, and then at the end of the semester, they might teach a single math lesson. Then in the fall, they had other methods courses and were also in the classroom. And so we supported them through the grant that I was working on um, and interviewed them at the end of the semester. And then student teaching semester, their final semester before they go out and get a job and are launched, is when I collected the majority of my um, data. And as you can see there, I had a student teaching interview at the beginning and the end of the semester, and then actually went and observed them teaching mathematics, and would have a pre-observation interview, post-observation interview. And then I did um, three focus group activities, which I'll talk about too. One is a reader's theater, where I had them actually go back at the end of the 18 months, look at their mathematical autobiography, and see if they had any change of heart in terms of how they felt about learning mathematics and learning to teach mathematics. And then conversations that matter, I'll talk about in a minute, as well as um, timeline activity. And these are two data collection um, instruments that I designed myself. So I had them for 18 months. And also what was really uh, unique about my three participants is I happened to have taught them the semester before. So I actually knew them for two years and then have actually followed them and that, but that's a whole other study as they're teaching, they're third year teachers now. But during that first semester, uh, before they went to math methods, I taught them a general classroom management and processes class where they felt very capable. So we had a lot of trust already gained. They knew that I had seen them in a position where they had excelled quite nicely in the class. It had nothing to do with math though. Okay, so conversations that matter. So given um, our time frame, don't have a whole lot of time in an hour, but I'd like to share, these were two what I would consider unconventional data collection sources that I've used in my study. And I've titled the first one, Conversations That Matter. And what I did is I gave each participant, these are sentence strips, so basically they're card and they're paper that we use in the classroom a lot for students. So it's something they were familiar with. If uh, a teacher is gonna have a bulletin board and they wanna have phrases and they put them in like a, a pocket, a chart pocket, they use these sentence strips. So I thought, okay, what if I start with a sentence starter and then have them finish it? So I would ask them questions about, tell me about a mathematical uh, experience that was challenging. Tell me about a mathematics experience that was positive. Um, a time when I, when I feel unsure about teaching in general versus a time when I feel unsure about teaching mathematics. So there were a total of 20 of these sentence strips. They filled them out on their own. And then what we did is we came together and then they talked, they looked for um, themes that they saw within each other's um, confidence around doing mathematics as well as worries about doing mathematics. And 
uh, it, was, it, it created a data source that was uh, really, really important to my study and very, very informative. And I think, you know, also by seeing that they're being math anxious was they weren't an anomaly, but being able to talk about it was also something that helped bring it to the surface rather than pretend that it doesn't exist. Okay, timeline activity. This one was really interesting. Um, what I did is you can see there's three sections of boxes, one for each semester, one, two, three. And in the timeline, um, what I did is these conversation bubbles above the timeline um, were used to record what each participant felt that they learned during the semester. And then underneath is questions, worries, concerns, um, tribulations that they had around math. And then what I asked them to do was just draw anything where they had a ha moment or a worry. So Phoebe, you can see the wave. So that's where she's not sure um, between going from her internship into her student teaching. And then in student teaching, you can see the smiley face. There were, there were aspects of mathematics where she felt like, yes, I can do this. Um, and then she had a worry or a concern back in methods that she felt got addressed when she um, was actually student teaching. Or a worry or concern that actually exhibited itself even more prolifically when she was student teaching. So, and, then, and then I asked questions and had them walk me through their timeline and explain what it meant. And basically it was interesting, because it followed nicely along with my questions, that there was this, I can do, I can, I can teach math even though I don't feel confident about math. Oh, I can't teach math because I don't feel confident about math. And I really don't know, I don't understand math. So all of these conversations that matter that they had not only with each other, but also as, um, as we talked and uh, I collected data trying to understand what mathematics anxiety consisted of. Okay, so then I began my data analysis by dividing it into two phases. So phase one, of course, I had to transcribe all my audio and video, and then I had multiple readings of each participant's mathematics um, autobiography and their transcripts. And then I used the iterative analysis from Bogdan and Bilgen's work to demarcate narratives specific to mathematics anxiety. So looking for those words. And then um, I identified a narrative. So I had different kinds of narratives. So using Connelly and Clendenin's work, um, a narrative uh, consisted of an individual's lived experiences or their interpretation of their experiences. And they came out in stories that they had to tell about a mathematics experience, either learning mathematics or learning to teach mathematics, as well as reflecting back on, hmm, uh, I wonder about this, whether it was learning, to, learning mathematics or learning to teach mathematics. And then, just to give you an example, here are some of the words or phrases that I demarcated in the narratives that pertain to mathematics anxiety. And these words across all three of my participants came up over and over and over again. Okay, then my ultimate goal was to develop three cases. And so I had to analyze the narratives in order to create this, this case. Um, so I began by utilizing an emergent coding scheme. And then um, from the coding scheme, I created plot patterns, looking at what was the main idea of the story or the reflection, which then created um, the need for me to write an analytical memo. And then from there, I constructed my case. And then I have the three junctures that followed across my data collection of, of 18 months. And so juncture one, I listed their experiences as a mathematics learner. So anywhere from kinder all the way up through uh, year 12. And then the experiences that they had was juncture two as a pre-service teacher learning to teach mathematics, as well as juncture three, then finally in student teaching where they're actually responsible for teaching mathematics for a period of four to six weeks, depending on the school district. So they have total control, total responsibility. So that way it gave me a nice um, uh, view of student learning to teach, now I'm teaching. Okay, 
So, unfortunately, I do not have time to share all three of my participants, so I've chosen Estelle. I'll give you just a sneak preview of the other two. So Estelle had multiple plot patterns across the three junctures um, that encompass the 18 months of the data collection. So I've chosen five that are highlighted here to share with you today. And so juncture one. Here's a typical one, um, Estelle's student experiences um, as she was learning to teach math. Okay. So she talks about wishing she could have been one of the smarties. So she, she was not classified or tracked as a smart kid. So we'll hear what she has to say. So as a nine-year-old, she couldn't understand why she got separated. And up to that point, her story, she talked about being able to do mathematics. She realized even early on, could you hear it? Oh, yeah. Okay. And she, she talked about being able, she felt successful in mathematics, but she knew she always had to work hard. And then all of a sudden, this test comes, one test comes along. And this is her interpretation. So that's the other thing that's really important to say here is that um, I'm interpreting their interpretations of their narratives. And this is what she saw, that I took a test, I'm in year four, fourth grade, and I obviously didn't finish in time, so that means I'm not smart in math, and oop, here goes, out, out of the classroom go the kids that are the smartest. So I'm just in the regular group. Okay. And then, this is really interesting, this is from her mathematics autobiography, so I don't have a recording of this, but she talks about specifically um, and very clearly, she began to build a wall. So she talks about the wall. Um, towards math and it still is sometimes tough for me to open up and soak up information and She talks about sometimes teachers would want to talk to me in private about how I was doing in math And they usually weren't positive talks I began to get embarrassed and started to overthink even the simplest mathematics equations and what I think interesting is um, Being a teacher, you know in the elementary and middle school classroom It may be that that teacher when she invited up here she invited the student up, which was Estelle in this case, she might have been thinking that this is an opportunity for me to make sure that Estelle understands you know, what we're learning. And Estelle saw this, as we call it in the States, um, the, the march of shame. You know? So everybody's going to know the teacher has to talk to me privately. And that was probably, I didn't get to talk to the teacher, of course, but that was probably not the teacher's intention. The teacher's intention was to offer some additional support. Okay. So then here comes once again, she talks about, and throughout these 18 months, she, talk, she must have referred to this wall, gosh, 15, 20 times. I think what's really interesting here is even her voice. She's speaking really, really softly because the confidence even talking about math. It's like she's, she's embarrassed, humiliated. And, and um, so as I was conducting this particular interview, you know, we were talking about different aspects of mathematics and then when it came to this part, she was talking like this. Okay. Then we move into math methods. So now she's in her, in her last 18 months of her teacher preparation program. And she had three narratives where she reported grave concerns about being able to teach mathematics, especially as she thought about student teaching kind of looming there in the near future. So here's this first one, plot pattern five that I'll share with you. I have nagging notions of necessary mathematics knowledge. So she's actually, um, in this interview, she's getting a little lighter You'll notice a difference in her voice, but the concern was definitely there. Oh my goodness, how am I going to be a good math teacher? And what if I can't reach and teach all of my students? Um, so what if I can't teach all of my students? And I kept thinking, I have to understand what I'm teaching for myself before I can teach it to anybody else. And I kept thinking, this is scary. And I kept thinking, math is the one subject that gives me anxiety. So very open about it. 
And then we move into student teaching, and in student teaching, she over and over um, narrated her grave concern in being able to correctly define mathematics vocabulary. That was a real issue for her. And she talks about, even when we're having the, the post-interview, um, I anticipated, you know, some of the students getting confused on certain parts, and then, am I confused? Are they confused? Are we both confused? So there was just confusion. And she was trying really hard after spending hours and hours of preparing during student teaching where she's being evaluated um, and has to pass all of the subject areas of teaching before she can graduate and get her certification. So uh, I, I entitled this Dilemmas in Distress, and it was a fractions lesson that this particular vocabulary had her concerned. So that was just great that I didn't, I didn't have to explain it to them. They explained it to the entire class. They knew exactly what it was. So um, I was just confused. I was confused. I was afraid that students would be confused on that aspect of the lesson. So during the pre-observation interview, before the lesson, she's talking about the vocabulary and hoping, she's like, I know what a numerator and a denominator is, but how am I going to explain this to my students? And then when she asks the students, she asks the class, who can tell me what a numerator and a denominator is? And students raise their hands, and the rest of the students in the class accepted the definition that the volunteers gave. It's like, woohoo! You know, once again, it was like that wall shielded and protected her. I didn't have to do it. And then she talks about uh, the aha and jumbled moments of teaching mathematics. And so she she's, would spend hours. I spent a lot of time preparing for my math lesson. Just because it did give me anxiety. And preparation and just making sure I had everything I need. That made me feel a lot better going through every day teaching my lessons. So, and as we know, as teachers, there's no way that you can spend hours on a single lesson when you're responsible for a whole class um, and a whole week, month, and year of lessons. But during student teaching, the amount of work that she put in, because she really wanted to do a good job teaching math. And one thing um, that she talked about explicitly, which I don't have time to get into today, but she wanted to be that teacher that helped kids to have an experience different than what she had. And so what I found fascinating about this is math, for Estelle, mathematics anxiety, her fear was she lost, was a loss of social belonging or opportunities to participate. Not being one of the smarties, the smart kids, she saw her stature in the class as less. And um, I should add, this actually, I've, I've written a paper that's been accept, accepted that's in great detail, a 30-page paper on Estelle in general, so I'm just giving you little snapshots today. But she really felt like she was um, discluded from learning the math. This was her own interpretation. And that when all of the kids were together before they got separated, if there was a math lesson, that the teacher was only interested in what the smart kids had to say. So she, this, she really took this to heart. Um, and then her coping strategy was to conceal from others behind the wall, which she clearly spoke about, what she understood to be her lack of mathematical knowledge and skills. And for the other two, for Phoebe, and she was very different. She, she actually was what we call a gifted student, so she was one of the smarties. She was sent out to do math um, with the smart kids, but second grade, so she was seven years old, younger than a she saw the students that she considered of her stature doing math quicker and having a better or more thorough understanding uh, much faster than she did. So she thought, how can I be gifted when I'm not doing math the same way that they're doing math? So she, she saw this as a loss of personal identity, and maybe she's really not gifted. So guess what she did from the time she was a little itty bitty girl? I'm not a math person. I do language arts. I can teach, you know, I, I'm good in writing, reading, social studies, but don't ask me to do anything in math. And that was her way of coping with the anxiety that she felt about mathematics. And then Roxanne, her mathematic, mathematics anxiety, she just had what we call, a, what I've called a loss of resiliency or the capacity to endure difficult experiences. She really, she just felt like she didn't understand math. Um, she couldn't, she couldn't get past <clears throat> trying to figure out beyond what an algorithm stated. And so what she did is she focused on these concrete methods 
for getting through mathematics experiences. And she's actually in another paper that I'm working on right now. So, discussion. What does my investigation add to what we know? So, mathematics anxiety may be persistent and varied. So, it may arise in response to a range of experiences with mathematics both enacted and imagined across a lifetime. What, I, what the research shows us so far is it's not just limited to formal testing situations, you know, as indicated by the work done by Brussel and Panasco, but it may arise in response to a range of experiences with mathematics both enacted and also imagined across a lifetime. And so this is important uh, to understand because um, mathematics anxiety may be more varied than prior research would suggest. So prior research talks about the physiological and the psychological aspects, but we have uh, experiences that also contribute to mathematics anxiety and experiences that are very different. And it expands the notion that mathematics anxiety may not be limited to a formal testing situation. Because okay? most of the mathematics anxiety that my three participants talked about had nothing to do with an actual test. It started there, but then it, it just got deeper and deeper as time went on. Ah, unique fears and coping strategies may be associated with mathematics anxiety. And I think that's the, the real key to what my work is. For Estelle, once again, the loss of social belonging or the opportunities to participate. And for Phoebe, it was this loss of personal identity or recognition for being a gifted individual. And for Roxanne, this loss of resiliency or this capacity to endure difficult experiences. So what did they do? They developed a very unique and different coping strategy which they use repeatedly across their mathematical experiences. And this is what I found fascinating, even when it failed to protect them from feeling stressed, embarrassed, and demoralized. And, the, and, and I think the interesting thing there is because sometimes it worked. So they were willing to use the coping strategies that they invented from the time they were you know, very young students all the way through student teaching. Okay? So for Estelle, we know she concealed from others behind the wall what she understood to be her lack of mathematical knowledge. Phoebe just insisting, I'm not a math person. Math's not my thing. And Roxanne just focused on how can I get through mathematics. So it, it, my work moves beyond physiological and psychological feelings of mathematics anxiety associated with taking tests. So I'll make that point again. It's, it's more than testing. Okay. And then strategies for coping, they may offer relief, but they limit learning. So if they're not really able to take in the math, then what are they losing? They're losing the content. And then guess what? They go to, um, to teach. They decide that they're going to be elementary teachers because they're hoping that there's very little math involved there, and boom. Hmm, surprise, they're expected to teach mathematics. Okay. So... So what did Estelle do when she was focused, when she was presented with teaching math? Um, I alluded to this a little earlier. She focused on projecting the qualities of a supportive, encouraging, and empathetic mathematics teacher. Phoebe, however, was concerned she didn't have enough knowledge or understanding to be able to teach elementary mathematics, so she turned her attention to the responsibilities um, that uh, were part of an elementary teacher that didn't involve math. She was going to be good at everything else. And then Roxanne, having experienced extreme defeat in learning mathematics, um, she, sift she shifted her focus on getting through by taking the minimal amounts of mathematics that she could in college, which just made the, her mathematics anxiety even greater. So taking these three cases together, um, I believe my research demonstrates that pre-service teachers' the use of certain strategies for coping with mathematics anxiety may ultimately do exactly what we don't want it to do, impede or, or separate them from the learning. Okay. And we're doing the time. Okay. So the other thing that was very interesting is all three women viewed mathematics as an important content to learn, but that it held very little appeal. So they weren't they were not um, anxious to learn math. So, and, and what happened with that is their strategies for coping with mathematics limited their opportunity to expand their understanding. So in this math methods course, 
They actually had two semesters of content learning in our mathematics department where it focused on um, all of the content uh, that one could be expected to teach K through 8, at least hitting like the, the main highlights. And the anxiety that they had, it was called uh, Mathematics 302 A and B. They would talk about how much anxiety they had in 302 A and B. And then what that does, though, is once again, they, you, can, you can put, we as teachers can put as much mathematics content in front of them, but if we don't deal with the anxiety, they're just going to use their coping strategies and, and shut the learning out. Okay. So we, from Ma's work, we know, though, it's critically important that our, our elementary teachers have a strong foundational understanding of the intellectual, demanding, and challenging aspects of mathematics. Okay. So I'm going to move past a few of these because I think we're short on time. This, though, is a, a, a very important point. Um, previous research has revealed that women elementary pre-service teachers who battle mathematics anxiety often believe they'll be able to teach mathematics. And so why is this? Because they're going to, in my study, what it showed is, okay, I'm going to, I'll be sympathetic. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to be the teacher that's there for the student that um, struggles in mathematics. Or I'm going to present the mathematics by using the curriculum that's given to me. That was Phoebe. And if I don't understand what to do, the book's going to tell me what to do. And for Roxanne, her way of getting through teaching mathematics is she was going to find, when she um, was employed during her first year of teaching, she was going to find some other teacher, a mentor, that she could basically you know, surround herself with to, to learn mathematics you know, or learn how to teach mathematics. She was hoping for a supportive um, mentor teacher. Okay. So what are the implications for teacher education? It's, first of all, narratives can provide teacher educators, that would be us, with the opportunity to address specific anxieties and concerns that some pre-service pre pre-service teachers encounter when confronted while learning mathematics and learning to teach mathematics. And so um, giving in, in our math methods course, having time to actually bubble it up to the surface. What are you concerned about? Because as uh, my work showed and other studies have showed, you can lead a horse to water, so to speak. So in other words, you can put the content in front of them. But if they don't think that they can do it, guess what's going to happen? Strategy is going to go up. And they're not. Okay? Um, once again, creating opportunities for pre-service teachers to engage in conversations about mathematics, anxiety, and confidence with peers in mathematics, math, math, method, bah, mathematics method courses may lead pre-service teachers supporting each other in learning to teach mathematics. And what I'd like to say there is Solomay's work that she's doing right now, um, which I'm really impressed with, is all about you know, working with pre-service and in-service teachers um, around mathematics anxiety. Bring it up to the surface so that we can deal with it and pretend that it rather than pretend that it doesn't exist and just kind of put them through our teacher preparation programs really unprepared to teach mathematics. Okay. Uh, and finally, um, explore. What I'd like to do next is explore identity development as it relates to pre-service teacher and early career teacher stages of development. So helping them to move past this simple surviving and instead thriving in the classroom. And then identifying factors that may help pre-service teachers confront their anxiety that they have about mathematics, while at the same time creating deeper and more coherent content base. Okay. And another paper that I'm working right, uh, right now on looks at content areas that pre-service teachers who have mathematics anxiety identify as being particularly difficult or challenging for them. It's interesting because across the participants that I'm looking at from the research that I've gathered, there are definite content areas that have come up to the surface. OK. So um, in terms of my uh, future research, uh, I'm looking at narratives that address how pre-service teachers make sense of classroom events, continuing with gender, language, and culture. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments? Yes. Because it would be interesting because now they have been teaching for a while. Three years. Three years. Yeah. 
Okay, so it's interesting. Okay, so Estelle, actually first she taught second grade and now she's teaching first grade. And what's happened there is she feels quite confident because anybody can teach first grade mathematics. Yes. And the scary thing there is no, <laughs> you still have to have, I, I, you know, my personal opinion there, and I think many of us would agree, is that's where we need our mathematicians, starting from the foundational aspects of learning math. But it was interesting, um, we, we continued to do uh, study groups with our participants, and all three of mine are still involved in that. And she talked about group work. She doesn't want her students to do group work because she'll say, uh, it's too difficult, I don't have enough time, but really, she is very comfortable in a teacher-directed algorithm style of teaching because that's what she can handle. There's her wall and boom, it continues on. So she, unfortunately, I love her dearly, but she's gonna be a teacher when little six-year-old says, what about, I'll get back to you on that. And guess what happens? Never gets back. So you didn't change this? No, no, um, not so much. I mean, she'll tell you her attitude about math is better but still the concerns, even at, even at a level of teaching six-year-olds, when it comes to taking a risk and putting herself out there, she can't do. Um, Roxanne is, she's probably doing, uh, we probably had the greatest success with Roxanne. She's up in Michigan. And she is in a school that really embraces children's mathematical thinking. And she's teaching fourth grade, actually, so little older kids. And she still has issues, but she'll ask uh, a mentor teacher, so someone that she feels safe with, someone who's not going to think that she's dumb or she doesn't get math. So that was her strategy, and she's using it. It's actually probably a, a positive thing for the most part. But still, when she comes to a content area or teaching in a way uh, where we're trying to get them to really get kids to explain their mathematical thinking, up comes that, nope, kids, we need to do it this way today. We're in a hurry. Um, and then Phoebe, actually, she, she, uh, she got married and just had her first baby and taught, this was her first year of teaching, she did kind of a tutor type situation for a year and then and she had math and I think she felt pretty confident there because she wasn't um, expected to be the one to teach math primarily, so she had some responsibility. So she could take kids in a small group, um, but she's not gonna continue to teach. So she's exiting herself from teaching. Yeah. Thank you, I found huh? that very interesting. Yeah. And resonating with some of my work on, um, where I followed students of around about 13 years old, yeah. or 18 months. Yeah. And what, what you found, I was expecting, I was expecting to um, have the students in my study experience the sorts of things that your students talked about. But I, I found your, your mention of imagined experiences very interesting because uh -huh. yeah. what I think, what the data I think you collected speaks to the students' current, with their present feelings about that. Yes. Yeah. And even though they're talking about the past, they, they're talking about a past that applies to the now. They've reconstructed their memories of those events. Yeah. Because we, I mean, we, can't, we can't remember being nine right. exactly. So it, 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 it's those stories that are particularly interesting because stories show that we processed and really thought about the event and turned it into something mm -hmm. significant. So especially that talk about building a wall, she, that's an adult perception of mm -hmm. the nine-year-old mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful, but it's a very powerful message about how she feels right now. And that's, um, so in my methodology, I, I couldn't speak to it very clearly here, but um, like I said, I'm very oh, happy. Very oh, okay, but, but this whole idea, that was her interpretation. Yeah. And what's interesting too is that timeline, you're right, as a nine-year-old, she would not have been able to um, share that. But as an adult looking back, you know, she's like, I built this wall. Yes, I had um, one student whose teacher told a story about how she caught, almost exactly the same, she brought her up to talk to her about yeah. the test and, she, and the student burst into tears yeah. and rushed off. But the student didn't talk about that event and didn't, didn't ah. make it into it. So the teacher recognized it as a significant event. Yeah. And I think if I spoke to that student as an adult, she would talk about it yeah. as a significant event. But she hadn't had time to 
turn it into something important. Right, right. And I wonder if it's that survival skill too that I've just got to get through this. Yeah, yeah as well. Very interesting. Other questions, comments? Okay, well, I, I was kind of, uh, somehow, it was kind of discouraging, maybe, your research. Yeah. Because even though they reflected a lot and then they recognized, because this was 18 months working with you, mm -hmm. then they go to teach, and then they, since the girls continue to rest, they are doing all right, but they are not doing great. Right. Um, so, so what, so they have, I have a, so what, what do you see that can change this? Do they have, because they need to have some positive experience. Exactly. And that's why I find your work so interesting, because I think in, in the States, we're at a point where we think mathematics anxiety doesn't exist. That was research from the 70s, blah, blah, blah. And now we're, it's starting to get attention again, because we have so much emphasis and focus around STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, probably just like here. And so it's like, oh, well, why, why are girls exiting themselves? Well, because there's still this, this idea that I can't do math. And Phoebe was, she was an excellent student. She had the advanced math courses all the way through high school and did very well. But in her mind, she got a B, not an A. And so she wasn't good at math. And all these people, you know, helped her. Dad made her do math. He was a physicist. So there's also a gender thing there. But um, what I like about your work, which is where I think we have to go, is we can, we can have them take a year-long content course on, how to, on, on mathematics that they need to really know, K through 8. But if this anxiety is there, it's, they're, they're, they're not hearing it yet. So that's where I think my work is gaining some, uh, an, an audience, is that, wait, we're not done with this yet. Yeah. Yes. First, if you have some successful experience, mm -hmm. I say somebody, some uh, girl coming to the university with a mass anxiety, studying for being a teacher, yes. but overcome this anxiety somehow. Yes. So if there are some positive experiences, if there are, what are the reasons for teaching? Right. And uh, in terms of uh, their formation as teacher, what kind of math course they have? And what kind of opportunities do they have in order to experience mathematics in a, I don't say pleasant way, mm -hmm. but with the, having the different kind of emotion you should get with mathematics, anxiety, and also success. Right. Do Excellent. Excellent question. And actually, I did a, a, a paper, a short paper, um, and it was about turning events. And Phoebe and Roxanne talked about, Elizabeth, excuse me, Estelle, <laughs> never had. Uh, these big aha moments, but uh, Phoebe and Roxanne both did. And the issue was they weren't sustainable. So in that math, that class that they took at the college level, that was for explicitly for elementary pre-service teachers, Phoebe talked about, oh my gosh, I never understood Roman numerals, and now I can do them the fastest. And Roxanne talked about, my goodness, I never thought symmetry was something I could understand. And yet then they go to their teacher preparation program, we have them in math methods, and the stress level because of that anxiety continues. So it, it gets into Lemke's work. Was that aha moment? Was it that teacher that was the knight in shining armor? Did it, was it sustainable? And for both of them it wasn't. However, Evelyn, who's part of a different study, she is incredible and she's a, a paper that I'm working on come January because I, I have her in a queue. She, she is the hope. Uh, she is one who also experienced incredible mathematics anxiety, but somewhere along the line she decided that, you know what, this is important for me to know so that I can teach my, my students. So she's teaching seventh grade math. And when she got the position to teach seventh grade math, I was like, oh my gosh, this is not good. But what she's done is she has confidence that now she can learn. So what is it about Evelyn? So that's what I'm trying to figure out in this investigation. Even though she knows, I like inequalities was something she had to teach her, her students. And she was wondering, so I've got this lovely narrative. I'm talking to my mom wondering, well, what does it mean when something's unequal? Oh, it's unequal. And so she, what she does is she addresses it with her class. And she has the confidence to say, we're going to figure this out together. So she takes on 
her students' mathematical thinking. She, she elicits them. Tell me what you think when you see this word. And over this two-week period of teaching inequalities, at the end of the two weeks, she's like, wow, not only do my students understand inequalities, I understand inequalities. I mean, it was fantastic. And she's got uh, another example, teaching fractions. What she does is she gives them a soup recipe, tortilla soup. She's a Latina. And she shares it with her students. We're going to make more soup, less soup. What do we need to do, fractionally speaking, to change the ingredients? And it was absolutely brilliant. And so in, in our uh, post-observations, in our pre-observations, she'll say, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but guess what? I'm smart. I can learn this. I didn't learn it the first time around, but together with these preteens, we're going to learn it together. And so this paper that I'm working on is look at what Estelle's done, kind of co comparing and contrasting. And my initial analysis is its confidence. She has the confidence to, um, to handle, to take on the anxiety that she felt and realizes, I don't have to feel this way anymore. I'm grown up. And I love teaching math, and she seriously does. Now, other issues she has, her classroom management, you know, I'm, I've, got, I've got to hang on to the desk when <laughs> I'm in there because kids are all over, some are off task, but for the most part, they're getting it. So that's the hope. Does that answer your question? We just need more. And you're right. I think we, we still have our head in the sand a bit that we think that we're just going to throw more math in front of them. It's not working. You know, more content until we handle the anxiety. Yes? I wonder about the effects of these students, or these pre-students teachers, always being taught by people who are really good at math. So they're, they're not getting the modeling of someone who has any math and value themselves, and so they're not seeing how to cope with that. And, and I'm thinking of a couple of teachers I've worked with who are superb teachers who are self-confessed terrible at maths. But because they've got into the point in their, their professional careers where they're drop the anxiety and have enough confidence in themselves as, as teachers, yeah. they have learned ways of coping with the fact that they can't do maths yeah. and have ended up becoming good maths teachers ah. because they use their students all the time. Mm -hmm. this like an Evelyn. Yeah. But that they do it purposefully yes. and you, all the time. And that they actually, uh, they don't fall into the trap that secondary school Northern teachers fall into where they over explain everything because they know the easiest and the best way to do it and this is how you do it and they, they show it really quickly. Right. They take their time, they model uncertainty and they model unconfidence yes. in mathematics and that's really good for students. And yes. So it actually it, it, it becomes really effective. So I think teasing up the difference between anxiety and, and lack of confidence in exactly. mathematics is really important. And that's what I'm seeing with Evelyn. Out of the 14, she is the only one <laughs> where I've seen the confidence be able to handle the, the anxiety. So teacher preparation programs, what do we need to do? Um, we need to address the anxiety through the lens of, I am an adult, I've got a good brain, these experiences may have occurred, but they don't have to define who I am. Now, do they have to go back and learn the content? Absolutely. So that you don't have second grade teachers explaining a subtraction problem that when bottom bigger borrow, you ever heard that one? I mean, things I just go, oh my gosh, where'd that come from? Uh, you know, you end up with kids having no idea of what they're doing. And then come high school, um, Randy Phillip does some fantastic work about asking kids about their mathematical thinking. And there was um, a presentation where he talked about, he showed us a little clip. And these are, once again, honor students, very gifted in math. And they're talking about, explain, they ask a student, explain what you do when you have three minus a negative four. And so the kids are going, well, plus, plus. Well, what does that mean, plus, plus? He's trying to get behind the proof of it. And so finally, one kid just says, I don't know. It's just magic. You know? <laughs> so you know, they, they don't know. And, and we know that that conceptual understanding, those underpinnings from early on, are so important, especially taken together with what kids already understand about math before we even get our teacher hands on them. So yeah. other questions, comments? I have a question about yeah. the Okay. The narrative? Ah, because I specifically wanted to get at their stories. And so Clandonin and Conley's work, they've, they were the ones that really set the tone that narratives matter in understanding teachers' experiences. And then Kathy Carter was the one who, who looked at narratives um, from well-remembered events. 
and then also um, storied lives events, so looking at lived experiences. And so I kind of took those all together and said stories matter because if you, if you were to look at Phoebe's grades quantitatively, she'd look like she was extremely um, good at, at mathematics. Okay? But she didn't feel that. So it's, I think you have to have both. The stories uh, help create the foundation of what the numbers have to tell us. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. And like I said, um, journal of uh, journal JRME, so Journal Research of Mathematics Education. Um, sometime next year, Estelle's case will come out, and I think the title is from my memory: um, uh, "Building the Mathematics Wall Brick by Brick: um, One Teacher's Experiences with Mathematics Anxiety." So, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.